I mentioned before in the break that we had before the start of this session uh, that this is not exactly the same session as the one I did yesterday. I actually picked a few different examples for today and we'll see how well that will go. Um, so my topic, as Sven said, is good enough architecture. How do, you, how do you know you've done enough of it? And the way I've tried to illustrate that is to talk about situations where I think there was not enough of it being done. So um, you will see some, some pretty horrifying examples. And of course, to protect the innocent, I've changed details and names. So if you happen to notice your own project, that is obviously a mistake and it just can't be true. And of course, none of you would ever be in any of those projects, right? None of you would ever make any of those kinds of mistakes that I'm pointing out here. So feel free to, uh, you know, not assume too much of your own context with these things. So let me jump in with, with three more general statements about architecture. Um, uh, the first thing that I uh, always like to point out is that people think different things about architecture. People think architecture means different things. Instead of definitions, I've decided to sort of distill it down to three of my beliefs about software architecture. Um, the first one is that I very strongly think that architecture is not an upfront activity. It is not something that you do before you start programming, right? You don't come up with a perfect architecture and then hand it over to somebody else to actually implement it. That is not the way things work. Some people would like to think that that's the way things work, right? They would love for things to be that way. Um, that, that may be because they are architects and have that as a label on their business cards and they want to want to feel like, you know, powerful. And um, we all know that bubbles don't crash. So it's very good to come up with this perfect architecture. And if in the end the system doesn't work, it's not your fault because you did a perfect architecture. It was just the stupid coders who messed it up and, and were are at fault for the disaster that occurred from that. I very strongly believe that is not something that can ever happen. Even if you think that architecture is largely up, an upfront activity, you still have to uh, do it over the course of the project and we'll get to that as well. So that is not what architecture is. The second thing that is very important to me is that architecture is not a description. Architecture is not documentation. I mean, documentation is a useful thing, depending on the size of the project. You might have some very extensive architecture documentation, but that is not the architecture. The architecture of the system is what the system exposes, what it is, the properties it has, right? A system has an architecture. It has an architecture that, um, and that means that it's, the, it's sort of the decisions embodied in the actual system, right? You made some decisions, others just happened to you, some were, uh, were um, on purpose, some were accidental, but at the end, the system has some sort of architecture and that is, why it's important to consider it. And the third statement I want to get across is that architecture is never good or bad in and of itself, right? It always depends on the context. It always depends on what it is that we're talking about. We can't judge the quality of any architecture or any architectural style without taking into consideration the, the circumstances, the requirements, the, the setup uh, in which this architecture needs to do something. You design an architecture for some specific purpose. There was a great question in the in the in the in the, at the Q and A at, uh, yesterday, um, which was how do you how do you measure whether your architecture is a success? Right? How do you measure whether you've made good decisions or not? And I think that is a, that is a very valid question, but it's also an interesting question to consider. Why did you not ask those questions before? Right? I mean, why don't you build an architecture that actually um, uh, is designed so that it matches certain requirements that are measurable, right? You want to improve something, so you choose this architecture, and then you can check whether whatever it was that you wanted to improve actually has improved, right? So measurement should not be an afterthought. It should be something you design in there. And that's just part of the context of the quality attributes of the system we're talking about. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to mention this, it's kind of funny because Sven is the, is the host here. You might know that Sven is also a colleague of mine. And um, the two of us, with, together with a bunch of other colleagues, are actually in the process of writing down some, uh, some anti-patterns. Some of the things that we've noticed happen to architecture uh, of, of systems in, in many projects we're involved with. Sometimes it's our fault. We make a lot of mistakes. That's sort of, the, you know, just a byproduct of working. It just happens. We also observe other people making very interesting 
and entertaining mistakes. And we decided to see where there are, whether there are any patterns, and if there are patterns, whether we can find a way to describe them in a way that they are useful. So this is just a, a simple catalog. I'll have to move a bit around so that you can see stuff, right? So these are some of the names that we've given to anti-patterns that we've noticed. And you might, uh, might have seen me mention some of them before, like domain LG, which is one of my, my old favorites. And sometimes you can probably conclude from the name what this is about. So we're in the process of writing that down and we hope to have something ready for you a little later on. So uh, you can check some here. Some of them like vendor driven architectural golf course, peer pressure should be kind of obvious to anyone who's ever worked in a large company context. So, but that's not gonna be my main topic today. My main topic is gonna to be, is going to be a few cases that I wanna use to actually illustrate some of the problems that occur in actual, in actual projects. So let me jump right in. For, for each of the cases, I first want to provide a bit of context, right? What is it that we're talking about, right? So in this particular case, we're talking about an e-commerce retail provider, right? That is the context of this particular, of this particular uh, uh, setup here. This is the context. So it's an e-commerce retail provider uh, with a global customer base. And the, con the context here was that uh, this particular client provided a, uh, set of services to its clients. So it's a little complicated because the system we're talking about here actually was a multi-tenant system that um, allowed our client to provide services to its clients, right? So our client was the, was the company we're working for and they provided a service to their clients that allowed their end users, their customers to shop for something, right? So you might think of your favorite, it's not them, but your favorite uh, shop provider, software as a service operator, they would, they would be doing something like this for their clients, right? This was our client and we were, we were working for them and helping them improve their architecture. And it was interesting because what they had done made a lot of sense. And that is a, another common thing, a common factor between many of those, of those examples that um, you can always, always see people wanting to do the right thing. They want to do what's good and they make all, all the decisions that they make are in the context of wanting to do the, the, the good thing, right? It's not as if anybody intentionally messes things up. It's not that they're incompetent, not at all. At the time they make those decisions, they make a lot of sense. In this particular case, this concerned customizability, the ability to actually customize the system so uh, that you can that you can uh, um, provide a very client-specific or customer-specific um, uh, view of that shopping system to, to each and every client, right? So if you're a customer of theirs, you wanted, you wanted them to help you provide an environment that had the right colors and logos and texts, and maybe some changes in the business processes, right? So those were the things that you, that you aim for when you, when you were a client of them, right? So, Making things customizable is a very good idea, right? That, is a, that seems completely reasonable and something that you, that you need to be doing here. Now, um, I need to um, move a little bit out of the way here so that you can see something. So that is, that is sort of the, the, the structure of the problem that we have here. We have different needs of different clients and those different clients have different um, requirements and different tolerances for certain things. So on the one hand, you have the acceptable cost. Some clients are willing to pay, for, pay a lot of money. Other clients don't have a lot of money and they're thus not willing to pay a lot. And you also have the customization needs. Some of them have very, very specific customization needs. And some of them only have very general ones, like maybe changing a few colors only. And of course you can position their, all clients' customers, all clients' clients, in different spaces in this graph, right? So you have very large strategic customers. Those very large strategic customers have a ton of money and they're happy to throw it at you, provided you can provide for their very, very specific requirements. They're willing to pay a lot, but they ask for a lot, right? Those are good clients to have. And they were happy to have a few of them, like two or three that provided for about a third of their overall revenue. Very, very strategic, highly important customers. They also had customers who were sitting here, sort of the long tail, right? Little, small customers, lots of them, who only had very modest needs. What they wanted to do was maybe add their logo and uh, change the way certain things were phrased and maybe change the colors, very basic needs. 
Now, the problem was that this particular client of ours wanted to do everything with one solution. So what they did was they developed this very sophisticated customization solution that actually included its own integrated development environment based on Eclipse. So when you wanted to customize their shopping experience, you downloaded a gigabyte package of software that gave you a, a real IDE with Windows and everything, you know, Windows and Views and editors and custom drawing, whatever, lots, lots of tools that allowed you to customize your experience in this particular system. The problem was that the long tail customers hated that idea. They didn't want to download an IDE. They didn't want to learn how to use it because it was very proprietary, proprietary right? Was, they didn't want to mess around with this stuff. They just wanted to change the logo and colors. Why would they need to do any of that? Well, but you had the large strategic customers, but guess what? They were unhappy as well because they'd be, they would, would have been perfectly happy just paying somebody for doing that stuff or maybe using some real programming environment as opposed to this you know, crappy IDE that they provided. But so they were, they were unhappy too. And what happened in fact was that our client had built a solution here, right in the middle where they had zero customers. They made nobody happy. And that is sort of the conclusion here, right? If you design attempts to satisfy too many people, you end up satisfying no one. And you can, you, can, you can talk for a long time about whether that is actually an architectural problem or not, you know, a basic problem of the, of the system overall. And I think it's, it's both, right? The architecture that they chose here to satisfy the requirement of customizability simply did not match the actual requirements that they had. They made a choice of architecture without really considering uh, the requirements and the context they were in, right? So that is a very common thing. And um, another lesson that you, can, that you can learn from this particular example is that highly specific code may sometimes be vastly preferable to configuration. As you probably know, any sort of powerful configuration pretty soon turns into a general purpose programming language and you'll end up being an accidental programming language designer, right? I don't know how many of you have, but basically every architect, every developer I talked to has at one point in their life developed something that looked like the Windows any file structure, you know, like this value, this key equals that value, this key equals that value. That is so simple that it's a simple configuration that you can just, you know, read in and interpret and have some runtime configurability. And inevitably these, this thing grows to have sections and loops and control structures and all of that stuff that you don't want to have in your, in your configuration. So my first, my first example here, right? Let's move to the second one. This is a large scale insurance system that I want to talk about. So forget about the B2B retail. We'll look that up in the video from yesterday if you're interested. So this particular thing is interesting to me because it's one of the, uh, one of the craziest things that I've seen in a long time. So I wanted to share that with you, with you as well. So in this particular case, the insurance provider did something that is called model-driven development. It's not, no longer in fashion, right? It's not something you do in a project today, but it's still very much in use with them because they started the project a while ago and it's still very much going on. It has about 100 people and those 100 people actually, well, they maintain the existing software. They add new products and new business services and new ways of selling stuff. So it's an ongoing thing that supports the market this particular insurance company is in. It's, it's life insurance actually, it doesn't really matter. So in this particular case, they managed to go through two releases per year. So that is not an error. It's not, you know, I didn't want to write day and, or, or hour or something. I just mistakenly wrote year here. That is the actual release frequency of software in a typical insurance company. So um, that is, and the reason for that is strongly related to the architecture of the development process that they chose, right? So the development process as an architecture as well, strongly related to the runtime architecture, but it's mostly the development architecture part that I want to talk about. And again, I'll move myself a little bit out of the way here so that you can see a little more. So what we have here is a, uh, a release process that spans a long time, right? So we're mostly um, in a six month cycle, and you can see we go from a vision to a business concept, technical concepts, and then this, this, this modeling thing, implementation, module, to, and so on and so on, right? So that is, that is what the process goes through. Now, this modeling phase is very critical because in the modeling phase, they can make, actually make meaningful decisions, right? In the modeling phase, they tweak the UML model, which is maintained in a, 
an ancient tool called rational rows that some of you may fondly or not so fondly remember. So whatever, rational rows maintains the, the UML model. And when they want to make changes, they have to make them in that particular tool. And then they generate tons of code for lots of different things. That could lead us into other pits of despair that I don't want to get into right now. So tons of code are being generated, but that happens in this one phase that spans two weeks. Now, what happens if you miss your slot? Just imagine you're a business person. You have this need in the market that you want to fulfill, right? You want to sell a new kind of insurance and you have these specific requirements, but you just, you know, you weren't fast enough to miss this particular slot because there's only a two week slot where changes to the model can be made. If you miss it, you have to wait for half a year. That's not a good thing, right? That's now the, one of the major problems here is that smart people come up with smart solutions, whether you like it or not. And while those smart solutions might solve their problem, they might not be that smart in the larger scope of things, right? So in this particular example, what people decided to do was they looked at the model and looked really closely and said, well, maybe we don't need that particular attribute anymore. So maybe we can repurpose it for something else, right? Let's make that now no longer the text class. This is now the region code because that's what we need for our specific thing. So things don't mean what they mean anymore, right? The meaning of the model has changed. So what do we do to maintain order in this chaos? Well, obviously we have an Excel sheet that sits on some network drive and that Excel sheet has a mapping of the name of the attribute or the model information to the actual meaning of that particular thing, which is to me, it seemed like the craziest thing I'd ever seen. It's like, you can't be serious. This cannot be the process that you're following. Well, of course they are. And of course, the first thing that happens in the two week modeling period is they clean up the mess, right? So the first few days of the two weeks are spent cleaning up all the messes they made in the, in the six months before to get things done because they somehow had to tweak the model to mean something else. Hor I think that's a horrifying story. I'm, I'm, I always feel sick when I, when I talk about it, right? There are a lot of lessons learned here. Centralized res responsibility hurts. The fact that there is one person maintaining this particular model hurts a lot because you actually end up relying so much on their time and, and availability, right? So the, the centralized responsibility will really, everybody will suffer from the bottleneck created there. Um, the second one was that um, you actually will always find good developers who you know, have an immediate need and they will find a solution, right? They have tons of examples for that particular thing. Like we had another project also with this model driven approach where, where it was very complicated to add new methods, right? To facades because they were supposed to be maintained in the modeling tool so that everybody could, could see the service facades. What happens? What's a good solution? Well, a developer develops one method called do something and then everything else is done in the do something method with a giant, gigantic switch statement switching based on some parameter to get things up and running. So that's a very, very typical example of that. And finally, a uh, final lesson here, just because you're used to it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's acceptable, right? I mean, just because you have been doing that for such a long time doesn't make it okay. The problem there is that everybody knew this sucked. Everybody who got into the project found out, well, that is a, what a bad idea, but they ended up accepting it and then they continued doing it for, for a long time. So not a good idea. So let me get to, the, uh, to my final example, which is actually number three in my, in my list here. A financial services provider with, uh, with independent brokers. So this is sort of a, a, a service provider that has a number of independent agents selling financial products. And they're very, very successful. And that is also something that you can notice quite often. Very successful systems very often have the worst architecture. There's some weird reason that maybe we can get to if we have time. So in the 20 years of company history, this, this company had a very, very interesting, uh, interesting journey through technology. So um, the first thing to know about this company is they started out with an Oracle stack, right? So they had like, well, that, was, that was okay back then. You had an Oracle Forms application. If you don't know what that is, be happy. Don't, don't think too much about it. Was, uh, was a style of application that's not no longer in fashion. So they started out with that, but they quickly added some other stuff, right? So you had like, some JSPs in some Java web container. Uh, you still had lots of PL, PLSQL in the database, so code in the database, but you had some modern, back then modern JSP based stuff on top of that. 
Now, of course, the system grew and growth means that there are new people and new people have different tastes. So the next people who came in and make, made architectural decisions ended up building a number of .NET web services because they preferred .NET and C Sharp to Java, which is okay. It's a matter of taste. I can, I can deal with that. Now they bought a second company. And the second company that they bought um, had to have a solution as well. They couldn't use theirs because it wasn't good enough. So they wanted to use their own solution. But the companies were slightly different, somewhat similar, but also slightly different. So they did what any reasonable person would do. They duplicated all the source code and created a second instance of that software to you know, work with the work for the other company's business processes. And then they decided to, you know, move everything into a single database because that cost them too much licenses, license costs. And then they found out that was, a, that was a huge mess and they had lots of complexity in there. And also it was kind of boring to use just one database technology. So they added a bunch more. So now they had this, you know, this whole zoo of different database technologies because everybody had their say and could add something at one point in time. And then they have my absolute favorite thing. This is my favorite story here, which is this C++ encryption lib that contained their own implementation of standard encryption algorithms. Now that alone is a, is a red flag, right? I mean, your own implementation of standard in, encryption, not a good idea. Don't ever, don't ever do that if you can avoid it. But they did it. And not only did they do that, they of course made mistakes while they did that. So they introduced subtle errors into the C++ code implementing those digital signature algorithms and encryption algorithms that they used there. But the problem was that the data, the documents that they encoded were persisted in the database. So when they wanted to switch to a, to a standard open source implementation of that encryption logic, they couldn't because only their own buggy implementation was able to decrypt the documents that they had in there. So they had to stick with the broken implementation and they still do. It's written in Borland C++. It runs in a Windows container. I forgot, probably Windows 2000, 2000 or something on some machine that nobody dares to touch, right? Because they're so reliant on this particular thing. So that I think, again, is a, is a good example of something that we don't want to see, which is what I labeled cancerous, cancerous growth here, right? The things can grow. And if you don't manage that growth, they, you end up with this disaster, right? Why do I say that successful systems end up with the worst architecture? Because there's only always, always features added to them, right? People have so much business interest in these things that they add features and forget to invest in architecture and they forget to actually try to, um, to improve the architecture over the course of time, which is something that you should be doing, right? You can't just expect an architecture to stay great. Maybe it never was, but even if it was, even if you have the state of the art architecture, chances are it's state of the art from a decade ago, right? So you have to figure out a way to keep things current and, and move them in line with what, you, what, what it is that you want to achieve. Unmanaged evolution will lead to complete chaos, right? If you're, I, I can absolutely and strongly relate to people being allergic to too much process, right? And too many rules and this old fashioned architecture governance style. But if you don't do anything like that at all, you'll end up with a huge mess as well. And that is something that you do not want in your life. Don't be afraid of some light architectural governance. There, I even use the word, right? Governance is something that people you know, frown upon as being unagile and the, the opposite of autonomous teams. And I think it's, it's important to have a little bit of that in any kind of organization that maintains something that lives longer than six months, which is essentially almost all of it. Okay. So again, I won't, be, I won't have time to do that because I want to discuss a little bit with you. So I'm going to skip uh, right to my um, conclusion here. The first one is, I think architecture is something that you have to deal with. You don't have to have architects. You don't have to label somebody and give them an extra role. That's not necessary. It may be a good idea depending on your organization, but it's definitely not something that you must do. So, but even if you don't do that, don't be afraid of architecture and architectural work. It's not a bad word, right? It is something that you need to address and you should address it very explicitly because otherwise you'll have to suffer the, con the consequences. In general, I think it's a very good idea to choose the simplest thing that'll work, right? You'll, you'll have to pick something that actually matches your needs, but don't overcomplicate things. Don't reject simple solutions because the simple solutions are often the better ones. 
that sounds like a, like I'm making a case for the Yagni principle. But again, you have to consider that all architecture work is a set of trade-offs. So sometimes you ain't gonna need it, can be interpreted in a too short-sighted fashion, right? You'll have to think of what is the what's the time, what's the time that you're actually looking at, and is this something that you should consider now because it's gonna be hard to change later on? So then you'll have to consider that. Related to that, I think it's important to create evolvable structures. You want to be able to change your mind later on. Despite the fact that they're being overhyped like crazy, I still think this whole microservices, self-contained systems thing, however you want to call that, is a useful step in the direction because it gives you added flexibility to improve things later on, right? As opposed to making all the decisions in the beginning. This is sort of the meta decision. Create the system so that you can change your mind later on. Manage your systems architectural evolution. I mentioned that before, but I can't mention it often enough. Um, you have to, you have, to uh, uh, have a plan for how you want to move the thing, the system forward. You can't leave it as it is forever. Just there's no system that can tolerate that for a significant time amount of time. And finally, if you're in one of those architectural roles, right, whether you're an architect or not, if you make those decisions, Make very sure that you don't create roadblocks, that you don't become the bottleneck in any way. Not you, nor the systems you're not, you create, nor the development uh, environment decisions that you make, process decisions that you make. Create value and get out of the way. Provide value to the people who actually have to suffer through your decisions and um, try to not inhibit their work too much. That's all I have. Thanks for listening.